I would like to invite uh, Monika Frejut, Justyna Straczuk, Ania Wylegała and Katarzyna Roman-Rawska to sit down uh, here at the table. And <clears throat> while they will sit down, I will briefly introduce you to this first plenary discussion. So probably everybody remembers that pictures that we see thousands of migrants trying to reach European Union by boats and ferries. It was 2015 when amazing group of people tried to reach promised land, Europe. Yes, they were migrations before, but this 2015, it was such a scale that it quickly started to be named in Europe the European uh, migration crisis. In that moment, there was no a common uh, politics in Europe how to uh, deal with, uh, there were no common regulations on migration, refugees uh, uh, and asylum seekers. So there was raised the, the, the slogan, let's be solidar and they, let's the solidarity and let's divide the, the people between our countries. But if you remember, many, most of European countries reacted on this migration crisis with crossing their borders and refusing to take in the arriving uh, refugees. And it was the situation in Poland. I don't know if you know, Poland said no, and it was very politicized and was very used during the elections in Poland. This fear against the migrants. I think that the professor Laura Zanfrini, who was the consultant of the United Nations in that moment, she perfectly summarized those events. She said, I quote, despite being the crandle of human rights and of the very concept of political asylum, Europe is at the same time dominated by the secularitarian logic. Europe has displayed the arbitrariness of its borders both internal and external. Since 2015, the European Union started to work hard on developing common uh, rules of uh, for the arrivals of uh, for the migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees. With time, however, new routes through which migrants and refugees came to Europe have appeared. In a result of the falsifications by the Lukashenko regime of the presidential elections, thousands of Belarusians started to leave the country because of the intensified repressions. Most of them came to Poland and, and Lit Lithuania. In 2021, because of these events, so-called Eastern European route through the Belarusian border to Poland, Latvia and Lithuania was launched by the dictator uh, Alexander Lukashenko. It was quickly named that he uh, instrumentalizes uh, migrants and refugee seekers to achieve his political goals. And finally, in 2022, the invasion of the Russian Federation on Ukraine provoke Ukrainian moving to European countries and to get temporary protections. So now we have experts who deal with this last events. We have 2020, 21, we have 22, we have movements of people. Let me introduce our guests who will now present us this, uh, this movements, uh, human movements. As the first, Monika Frejute, she is the senior researcher at the Institute of Sociology at the Lithuanian Center for Social Sciences. She is a doctor of social sciences in sociology. Her main research interests relate with the social inclusions and equal opportunities of ethnic minority groups in Lithuania society and include analysis of identities of ethnic minorities. Justyna Strakczuk, our the second speaker, he's assistant professor at the Polish Academy of Sciences. She's social anthropologist and uh, sociologist. She's author of monographs and numerous articles on the cultural diversity of the Polish-Belarusian-Lithuanian border. 
Her recent re ethnographic research focuses on the humanitarian crisis at the Polish-Belarusian border with a particular interest in the interactions of securitarian and humanitarian reasons, the interdynamics of grassroots solidarity movements and the environmental dimension of this crisis. Anja Wilegawa is a sociologist and social professor at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences. Her work focuses on the individual and collective memory in Poland and Ukraine, and on the social history of the Second World War and the immediate post-war period. She's an author of numerous books, among them Displayed Memories, Remembering and Forgetting in post-war Poland and Ukraine, published in 2019, and the recently published book in Polish, There Was an Estate, There Is No Estate at the More, Argitka Reform in Poland. Anna currently coordinates the project, uh, Polish part of the project, 24 of February 2022, 5 p.m., Testimonies of the War, which focuses on the Ukrainian migrants. And our last speaker will be Katarzyna Romanrawska. She's assistant professor at the Institute of Slavic Studies of the Polish Academy of Sciences, literary scholar, sociologist. She is also publicist and literary, and literary translator. She works on the intersection of culture and politics, as well as anti-regime and anti-war resistance in contemporary Russia. Thank you for accepting our invitation to this panel. And now I would like if you could say us, present us a broader picture of the movements that you are uh, researching, but also focus on your research and say now something more that we better understand this, this last movement that we experience here in our region. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, uh, Zuzana. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, Zuzana Bogumil, for founding me and inviting me to, to and uh, giving me this opportunity to present uh, my our on ongoing research uh, with, with we perform in Lithuania. And uh, as Susanna told, uh, I talk about migrants from Belarus in Lithuania, and um, I made a PowerPoint presentation and think that it would be easier to, to listen or to just see, you know, the numbers. Um, first of all, I would like to talk about the numbers and the context, and it's very important because, because uh, the number of foreigners in Lithuania is increasing every year, and in uh, 2023, uh, actually, currently, uh, in 2024, in the beginning of uh, 2024, uh, there were more than uh, 227,000 of foreigners in Lithuania, and it make about 8% of uh, all Lithuanian population. So, three largest group of uh, foreigners living in Lithuania, and according to the citizenship in the Mm, beginning of uh, 2024, the biggest group were Ukrainians, uh, over uh, 86,000 of people, from uh, whom majority of them are uh, war refugees. The second uh, biggest group is uh, Belarusians, uh, over uh, 62,000, and Russians, over 15,000 uh, of people. Uh, so in the beginning of 2024, uh, as I said, the Belarusian group uh, uh, make uh, over 22,000 and uh, migrants from Belarus was the biggest group uh, uh, who came from the state Belarus, uh, uh, more than 15,000, even more than Ukrainians came, came in Lithuania in 2023. Uh, most of foreigners live in the biggest city of Lithuania, that is in Vilnius, Kaunas, Klaipeda, and Shule, and uh, the majority of them in Vilnius. It's uh, over 60,000 of foreigners. And if to talk about legal status, in 2023, for citizens of Belarus, more than 35,000 permits for temporary residents in Lithuania were issued or changed. 
and citizens of Belarus in 2023 was the largest group of asylum seekers in Lithuania. The numbers are small, but still it's, uh, uh, they constitute 40% of all asylum seekers in Lithuania. The number of workers um, from foreign countries uh, in Lithuania increased by 65% in the uh, percent in 2023, and it was up to 142,000 of uh, foreigners, and, and uh, most of them uh, was uh, Belarusian people. Sanctions. I, I think that it is very important to talk about sanctions because the Belarusian group also faces certain stricter measures uh, purposefully implemented by the Migration Department uh, to control the entry and stay of Belarusian and Russian <laughs> citizens in the country due to the threats to national security posed by the Russian and Belarusian regimes. And this is reflected in the figures, I would say, because in 2023, for Belarusian citizens, uh, 2,406 temporary residence permits in Lithuania were cancelled. And uh, also for citizens of Belarus, uh, comparing to previous years, <laughs> accounting from 2019 in uh, 2023, the biggest number over 1,000 uh, of decisions we are made to return them to Belarus. Also in 2023, only 39 temporary residence permission issues to Belarusian citizens arriving under an investment agreement uh, or the basis of uh, collective relocation. While, for example, in 2022, it was uh, 148. So the reasons uh, for migration, um, and it proves uh, also other sociological research, it's uh, two biggest events because immigration after 2020 were increased to Lithuania from Belarus. And uh, the first event was the repressions after the mass civil protest in August 2020 against Lukashenko's regime. And uh, also the next uh, important event was uh, in the February 2022 when Russia started war again against Ukraine. Uh, so, to conclude, um, there are various type of migrants from Belarus in Lithuania, but most of them, most of them actually are labor migrants, other political refugees, but in, uh, in the project we conducted, um, we focus on migrants from Belarus, Ukraine and India, and who came to Lithuania after 2014 and have asylum uh, or permanent or temporary residence uh, permission in Lithuania. Let me present uh, our project, uh, which is in the progress. Uh, we started only in April 2023, and we will finish it uh, on March 2026. And um, our Institute of Sociology, together with researchers from the Institute of Asian and Transcultural uh, Studies of Vilnius University uh, carrying out the project which uh, is named Ethnic, National and Transnational Identities and Geopolitical Attitudes of Third Country Nationals in Lithuania and in the context of the war in Ukraine, financed by the Research Council of Lithuania. So the main questions of the research uh, is uh, how migrants' identities and geopolitical attitudes are affected by immigration, uh, the experiences of living in Lithuania, and the war in Ukraine. And uh, we con uh, conduct the field research um, that is semi-structured interview and uh, unstructured life story interviews in the three largest cities uh, of Lithuania, Vilnius, uh, Klaipeda, Kaunas, and Klaipeda, Particularly me, I am working with uh, immigrants from Belarus, and, uh, and now we are completed uh, interviews in Vilnius, uh, which started from August uh, and end at March. Now, actually, now, and I conducted uh, sixteen 
interviews with the Russian people, and most of the interviewed people, persons are political refugees, as well as uh, those who arrived with a humanitarian visa uh, and have a temporary um, residence permit on humanitarian grounds due to the persecution in the country. Uh, several of them uh, was uh, labor migrants. Uh, for example, one of them have uh, both uh, Belarusian and Lithuanian citizenship, uh, both men and women. Many of them have work uh, in Lithuania. Some are with the families and have children. Uh, most of them, I would say, they have traumatic experience uh, uh, because uh, due to their repressions and uh, putting them in the prison and having administrative or criminal criminal penalties uh, uh, from Lukashenko's regime. And uh, let's share uh, some insights from this uh, interview that I made. And uh, because we focus on, on identity, so I will talk about uh, about uh, civic, ethnic, and transnational identity of, of them. And uh, what was noticed that uh, they uh, contrasted in the in during the interviews, they contrasted uh, those people who are economic uh, migrants and uh, versus political refugees, uh, uh, those who have humanitarian visa and uh, those who are uh, re relocants. Uh, the term relocation is used by Belarusian in two senses. Uh, one sense is to avoid call the, calling themselves as, as migrant, instead uh, as a people temporarily living in Lithuania, because we do not have the opportunity to live in their own country. Uh, and also we use this term when we want to contrast themselves as a person who was forced to leave the country due to persecution and people who work in, for example, be Belarusian companies and have move, moved their business to Lithuania, who have uh, a blue card and get the uh, right to live in Lithuania for three years together with the family members. If to talk about uh, civil identity, the turning point for both of the informants and for many Belarusians in Belarus, uh, they mention the 2020 uh, after the reached presidential elections and subsequent repressions. Uh, they felt, they said that uh, they felt like ethnic Belarusians, but after 2020, civic identity also appeared for them. For example, one, one girl said that she felt patriotic feelings before, but uh, after those events, uh, the, uh, her vibe has changed. And you can see who, <laughs> who know Russian language actually interview with uh, her. If to talk about uh, ethnic identities, so the language, Belarusian language, is very important element of the ethnic identity. And what we mm, mm, noticed that uh, uh, Russification, uh, the, the big Russification uh, in the, the country, Russian was spoken in the family, no one taught learned Belarusian at school, and after 2020, the status of the Belarusian language in society has changed. And for example, they, they mentioned that, uh, all of them mentioned that, for example, for, for former uh, those who spoke Belarusian, they were perceived as people uh, from countryside or less educated people. But now, after those repressions and elections, uh, those who speak Belarusian language, uh, they they perceived as well educated people and with civic identity. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, they are uh, from very uh, different uh, ethnically mixed uh, families with very different uh, uh, historical experience uh, of uh, and uh, ideological uh, attitudes uh, uh, from fa from the families members, but uh, they feel still they feel Belarusians, and. Uh, if to talk about uh, relations with Lithuania, so for most of them uh, in the plans is written to Belarus. And I remember one woman said that as soon as there is an opportunity, she will be the first who will stand at the Lithuanian 
Belarusian border <laughs> who came back to Belarus and uh, she expressed to herself that she is uh, physically living in Lithuania but mentally she is in, still in, in Belarus. And uh, so, but it's uh, when considering the transnational identity and the various family, economic, social, organizational, religious, and political relations created by Belarusians between the country of origin and Lithuania, so several prevailing aspects are noticeable. That is, the, they communicate in narrow groups of migrants from Belarus, taking into account uh, work areas or friendship. Also, we work uh, mainly for Belarus, uh, so orientation is to the community which rests uh, and stay in Belarus mm -hmm. and uh, follows the events in Belarus and keeps in contact uh, um, with the family members. So few contacts with Lithuania, they live mostly in Vilnius and travels very little, does not have many friends among Lithuanians, does not know the Lithuanian language. So while the reason mostly is that they uh, do not plan to stay in Lithuania. And uh, for the summary, very shortly that... Uh, this was mainly very educated uh, political refugees from Belarus uh, who working in the field of human rights, education, media. So this represents only one perspective of, of people. And I think I will stop there because, yes, <laughs> thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Uh, I have already a lot of questions, but we will leave questions at the end. And now, Justyna. So we know about Belarusians who are leaving the country in en masse, uh, but uh, these are not only these people who are forced by the um, Lukashenko regime. So could you say us something about this, uh, what is called in the European Union, the Eastern route? Uh, and this uh, humanitarian crisis on the P Belarusian border with Poland, Lithuania, and Latvia. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me and for just for um, making space for this particular uh, migration movement because uh, it is not very um, often uh, talked about in public space as compared to Ukrainian movements, for example. Uh, so, um, as uh, Zuzana uh, said, uh, I am a social anthropologist and an ethnographer, but at the same time, I am also uh, uh, an activist on the Polish-Belarusian border, and uh, which makes me an involved party in, in, in this issue, uh, but also gives me a, a unique perspective on what's going on on the ground, uh, and how different actors are um, involved in, in, in the conflict that takes place um, there. Um, when I was thinking about uh, what is uh, special about this particular uh, migration movement uh, as compared to other uh, movements that will be discussed here during this uh, uh, plenary session, I um, identified uh, two key issues, which is the um, instrumentali instrumentalization paradigm, which uh, um, which is a very useful um, device for uh, restricting uh, more and more refugees' rights. And uh, the other um, issue is uh, so-called uh, organized hypocrisy, uh, which is uh, the difference between words and deeds, and which of course, whenever um, norms and values, uh, uh, when whenever there is a tension between norms and values and needs uh, and wants of 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 all the involved parties. So, um, starting with this instrumentalization. As you, uh, as most of you uh, know perfectly well, I suppose, um, all the so-called uh, um, humanitarian crisis on the Belarusian border started in August uh, 2021. 
uh, when uh, hundreds and then a thousand uh, migrants uh, from uh, conflict zone in uh, middle in Middle East and in Africa appeared suddenly on the um, Belarusian border with uh, Poland, Lithuania, and and Latvia. <clears throat> And it uh, soon uh, turned out that uh, all this movement was um, triggered by uh, the regime of Lukashenko in response to to uh, the restrictions that was uh, that were imposed on uh, his regime uh, by the EU countries. Uh, so those thousands of migrants were brought directly di directly. Uh, um, by air uh, to to Minsk and then taken to the border and just uh, just to um, faci facilitate them to to cross uh, the green border. Uh, this movement was very quickly dubbed as a hybrid war, uh, where migrants were dis describes at, at, as uh, pawns in um, Lukashenko and Putin's hands and as a threat to the sovereignty of all those uh, attacked uh, countries, which, uh, uh, which of course, uh, uh, well, dehumanized and stigmatized, um, stigmatized the migrants and uh, made possible certain violent movements. Uh, all the three governments that just took uh, unprecedented me measures to push the migrants back to, to, to Belarus uh, in a complete breach with international and uh, also national law. Uh, they were denied right to uh, asylum and violently forced to the other side. Uh, um, so, so as a result, hundreds or even thousands of people were just stranded in this uh, specific exclusion zone between uh, between the borders uh, in uh, sometimes in very dire condition which of course cause uh, much of human suffering and uh, and deterioration of health and also um death um, uh, cases and uh, up to now uh, we have uh, registers um, 57 deaths uh, of migrants on on the Polish Belarusian uh, side of the border of of the Polish side of the border, but this number might might be uh, much higher just because the region uh, when the conflict takes place is a uh, is a primeval uh, forest uh, which is not very easily uh, accessible. There are swamps, uh, and well, bodies are uh, are found uh, anytime. Uh, and I think uh, I think um, this number uh, might uh, might increase. So um, after uh, Russian aggression, uh, this instrumentalization uh, narrative has even increased, uh, intensified, just because uh, uh, the sense of uh, threat has increased and, and the fear has increased. So less and less uh, people uh, criticizes the, the actions of Polish uh, government. So pushback started to be somehow accepted due to security reasons and critics of, of this policy were um, were uh, described as uh, traitors or uh, useful idiots uh, of Putin. But uh, Russian uh, invasion on Ukraine uh, also uh, just visualized the double standards that uh, exist uh, in treating um, refugees from global south and refugees from uh, from other countries of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, and well, it showed what is at heart in this in this conflict that uh, in this crisis that takes place on on the Belarusian uh, border, uh, which is namely. Um, a Russia, a racialized uh, regime of European um, borders and uh, well, the, the global inequality of of passports, uh, which makes it impossible for for citizens of um, such countries as Syria, Afghanistan, or, or Iraq to seek legal ways to uh, safe places in in Europe, and this is why they they just uh, uh, risk 
their life and their uh, their health just to 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 to, to get here. Uh, but coming back to 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 the uh, instrumentalization, why why I think it, it's a completely flawed uh, uh, concept. Uh, well, first of all, um, well, it's really difficult to distinguish between what is artificial and what is natural in in a migration movement. This is a process, a dynamic process that can hardly uh, be controlled. Uh, all these uh, instrumentalization narratives treat migrants as just uh, passive uh, um, par passive participants of 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 Belarusian uh, regime. Uh, um, uh, agenda, uh, but it is not uh, so. People who are migrant migrating uh, uh, here have their own um, agency. They just uh, uh, want to, um, well, they, they just want to find a safe place for, for themselves to uh, to live. And uh, this is not on, only a state, but uh, there are also many non-state actors uh, much more non-state actors that uh, take part in facilitating uh, to cross those the green uh, border the the whole group of of those migrants that are crossing the Belarusian border is very uh, heterogeneous. Uh, uh, when we meet people in the forest, they are not necessarily people who just uh, get there by Belarusian visa. Uh, most, many of them just uh, traveled to the Belarusian border um, just on themselves uh, overland, uh, such as people from Afghanistan or uh, people from uh, Tajikistan. This is a very di differentiated uh, group. Uh, there are also uh, uh, many people who uh, stayed, uh, especially from Africa, who stayed uh, in uh, Russia for uh, several uh, years. Well, Russian is the intermediary language that we would communicate with those people. And uh, so, and well, once the uh, the uh, passage has opened, this route to uh, through Belarus has opened. They just decided to uh, to um, go and to find their place in, in in Europe. And and there are also uh, very misleading numbers because still this migration move is very very uh, low as compared to uh, to. Uh, Mediterranean route or uh, Balkan route, uh, and of course to uh, to um, Ukrainian uh, millions of Ukrainians uh, migrants that were welcomed in uh, in, in Europe. Uh, in the peak of the um, of the conflict uh, in 2021, Polish border guards uh, regist registered. Uh, less than 40,000 attempts to cross the border. But uh, you must remember that these were, uh, most of the attempts were made by people who were pushed back uh, uh, there and forth. So, so um, the numbers of, uh, of those people are, are uh, much uh, less. Uh, I, I suppose Grupa Granica, which is which, uh, uh, well, whom I am part of and who, who works uh, of uh, on this uh, border, um, uh, uh, they count that uh, it is about several, just several thousand of of, of people who who cross the border, and also those numbers, those numbers of uh, attempts to cross the border. Uh, um, dropped significant, significantly in, in, in 2022 uh, uh, to 6,000 attempts. So these are really very low numbers uh, uh, and that uh, don't pose real threats uh, uh, and such a threat that could not be addressed uh, by uh, those existing legal uh, means. So now uh, coming back to, to, uh, to the uh, other issue, which is the organized hypocrisy, which is, uh, of course, uh, used not only by Polish government, uh, but also for, for with, uh, well, with all the um, European Union. But in Poland, it is uh, especially painful now when we have uh, a change of our government into, uh, well, a democratic one. 
uh, our prime minister uh, assured that uh, uh, after the change of the government, uh, the situation on the on the border will change, because previously uh, all those violent uh, violence on the border, uh, well, the the previous government was uh, right wing government uh, who was known for uh, for uh, its. Uh, uh, Islamophobic and xenophobic attitude was blamed for for the situation, uh, but now um, in January, over a hundred uh, NGO organization uh, made an appeal to to our prime minister just to withdraw the so-called uh, expulsion uh, law, which uh, is uh, in breach with uh, uh, European, uh, of course, in breach with European and also national uh, law, uh, which uh, make impossible for, for border guards to, to, to push back people to back to Belarus. But of course, the violence haven't, haven't uh, stopped. And uh, as our deputy minister uh, for uh, migration, who is uh, also uh, acknowledged uh, researcher in uh, uh, international uh, migration, yes, he he just claims that uh, pushbacks only may only stop when when the uh, when the border is completely sealed, which is of course never. This deputy minister is also the author of of the uh, famous um, famous term of uh, humanitarian pushbacks, as as it is as it would be uh, at all possible to be humanitarian, uh, just uh, being uh, violent in the in the same place. So using this uh, this humanitarian narrative uh, on the one hand and and uh, well and. Uh, still um, being violent, uh, on the other hand, uh, is something that uh, that is uh, very dangerous because uh, uh, it somehow uh, appeases uh, consciousness of people who, who now uh, who are not engaged in, in, uh, in this conflict on the ground and uh, who just believe what uh, our government is, is talking about. So, so this is uh, this is dangerous because uh, it uh, prevents any any reform uh, of the system uh, because if uh, everything is on a good track and we are going to be humanitarian so uh, so what's 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 wrong in, in it so so this kind of uh, uh, organized hypocrisy uh, just uh, strengthens the system that uh, exists and not opposes it and uh, this is why i think it is it is so so um, dangerous and um, and i i can see that the conflict will uh, continue uh, well, for, for a long time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Justina, for your for your introduction and uh, to this problem. And I want to say that on 20 December 2023, it is just uh, recently, the Council and the European Parliament, they have agreed, they make agreement on the contentious crisis and force measure uh, regulations and this is called by the refugees, uh, various NGOs, Byzantian in their complexity and Orbanesque in their cruelty. The program, the, this 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 new regulation, uh, dehumanizes migrants and talks about a lot about instrumentalization of migrants and to some extent uh, permits pushbacks. Uh, uh, so it is it is really very important what you said. And now I would like to ask. Uh, Anna Vilegawa to say us about the Ukrainian refugees. Please, Anya. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, well, as Susanna mentioned in the very beginning, I'm not a migration scholar at all, uh, but I will be talking nevertheless about Ukrainian refugees in Poland because this is where I ended up when the full scale. Uh, Russian aggression, aggression towards Ukraine started, uh, leaving my abandoning my project on the Holocaust in Ternopil region. So you see the movement as well in my uh, professional career. So I will be talking about uh, what we did uh, during last two years concerning Ukrainian re refugees in Poland and also in other countries. So yeah, I will just I will just start with a little disclaimer. I know I know that we use these umbrella terms, but as 
as a person who speaks with refugee, refugees and is very sensitive towards giving them voice and using their words, I would say that Ukrainians are not migrating uh, after February 20 for 2022 and they were also not migrating after 2014 because this is when all it started they are being displaced they are fleeing they are uh, being deported sometimes they are also as seeking asylum and out of this 220 interviews we conducted in Poland i never heard a word i migrated so this is quite uh important uh we are not conducting a quantitative research, but nevertheless, I thought that I will provide you with some numbers because it gives us a broader perspective. So uh, as of March 2024, uh, we have around uh, five to seven million internally displaced persons within Ukraine, which meant that they left the, the territories that are too dangerous to live in or that are uh, occupied by Russian by Rush by Russia and they moved to some uh, regions considered more safe to live uh, in Ukraine and the numbers are not really certain because these numbers are changing uh, on the constant basis and these people are all the time moving so th this is always around uh, five to seven millions and not strictly five or seven. Um, also, uh, more than 6 million uh, Ukrainians left Ukraine uh, since 2022, uh, and more than 4 million currently uh, use this uh, status of refugees in the European Union. And right now we have around 1 million of Ukrainian refugees in Poland, but we used to have at the highest point around 3 million of Ukrainian refugees in, in Poland in spring 2022. And this is all, as I, as I mentioned on the slide, oscillat oscillatory migration, which means that a person might be uh, in Poland uh, for two months and then she's moving back to Ukraine for 29 days because this is what the Polish law uh, allows you. And then she's moving back to Poland and then moving back to Ukraine. And the same happens uh, with uh, other Ukrainian uh, countries uh, as well. And I will be talking about today about the, the Polish part of the initiative that started uh, in spring 2022. And the title is 24 of February 2022, 5, 5 a.m. Testimonies from the, from the war. The structure of the initiative, because it was not a research project, it was a documentary or documentation initiative. And this is also why I'm not going to present you with the conclusions, the results. I will be talking much more about the ethics and methodology and also about what we have in our collection and what we are going to do with the collection, because as it was not a research, we didn't have, I would say, precise research questions. And I will talk more about it. So at that point, we had uh, Ukraine with Center for Urban History of East Central Europe in Lviv. From Poland, we had my own institution, uh, which is the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, Polish Academy of Sciences, uh, Polish Oral History Association, which provided us with expertise in oral history, and also Miroshevsky Center, uh, which was um, supporting us fi financially when the uh, the uh, emergency funding was not even available uh, in spring 2022. We had the partner from the United Kingdom, which was the new University of St. Andrews, and a partner from Luxembourg. And we also had two partners from Germany, which somehow uh, didn't make it to the presentation, <laughs> uh, which is the University of Hagen and the University of Munich. And what we wanted to do, and I will focus now mostly on what we did in Poland, well, we wanted to record the Ukrainian experience of war, wherever these Ukrainians were, in Ukraine, in Poland, in Luxembourg, in Germany, and we wanted to conduct oral history. There are a lot of controversies whether it can be at all called oral history, because it is an ongoing crisis, an ongoing war. It was not completed, but nevertheless, we believe that the oral history approach was most vital and most useful, and I think that the entire project proved that we were right. Um, so we wanted to create an archive for future research, future research, uh, education and art purposes. And it was a documentation and not research at that point. 
And also we wanted somehow to bring the message to the Polish and European societies, because this is the difference between what we did in Ukraine and in Poland. Ukrainians don't need to remind their citizens that there is ongoing war. I have a feeling that in Poland and uh, even more in, ad in other Ukrainian, European countries, we need to remind ourselves that these Ukrainians that we meet on the street, they are not migrants. They didn't came to work and live in Poland. They are refugees, they are, they are refugees, they are war refugees, and their stories need to be told. And we also wanted to initiate the discussion on ethics and methodology because this war, the full-scale invasion of Russia against Ukraine is, is called the most documented war ever. And there is a, a piece of truth in this statement, but a lot of research and documentation is not done properly. I'm not telling that our is the best one in terms of ethics and methodology, but I believe that uh, we need to pay a lot of, of attention to how we conduct the research on the ongoing crisis, and Justyna knows it because uh, she's also uh, researching the ongoing crisis. We need to be very, very sensitive. So um, how we paid this attention to this ethical and methodological issues where we, we only conducted, conducted this documentation in Ukrainian or Russian. We didn't use uh, interpreters. We only had experienced researchers uh, or practitioners in the team, which meant that there were many volunteers they wanted to join the team. But for example, they were Ukrainians who came to study in Poland. and they wanted to do something, uh, but they never ever uh, conducted any single or history interview. So then these were not people who could join the team because we believe that this is not the moment when you can train people to conduct the interviews if you work with refugees. So uh, we also had the refugee scholars in our team, which opened a lot of doors to us. As I mentioned, we, we conducted oral history interviews and we focused on everyday life. And we also uh, employed the broader context of interviewees' biographies. biographies. Uh, these were not bio classical biographical interviews, but we always ask a question about the life before the full-scale invasion. And sometimes it lasted for three hours. <laughs> so these are long-lasting interviews, which is which has some consequences. <laughs> a lot of hours of audio recording to transcribe. We only conducted audio, which was our conscious decision because we believe that this provides us with the necessary condition for the intimate and comfortable atmosphere. And we also consult consulted the questionnaire with the psychologist because we believe that we are not specialists. We, we will never have the skills to see whether this person is already experiencing PTSD or not, but we might at least ask professionals how to do it uh, in a most reasonable uh, possible way. Uh, we were following the interviewees, uh, thinking about our agenda, which, me which meant that we had this questionnaire of questions focusing on everyday life, and we provided people with this questionnaire in advance so that they could prepare, but there were multiple questions that were never asked people because people didn't want to answer them. So uh, it was their agenda to answer the questions or not. Our main idea was to make no harm and don't hurry, uh, and also to exclude from the sample the most vulnerable individuals, because they were all vulnerable, because they were refugees in Poland, interviewed by the Polish and Ukrainian researchers uh, affiliated with the Polish Academia. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that we are not harming anyone more than it is necessary to conduct this documentation. So we didn't conduct the interviews in the shelters, in on the border, uh, with people who just crossed the border, with individuals who expressed any kind of uh, psychological distress. I understand that in general, when you're a refugee, you are in a constant psychological distress, but there are levels of this distress. So we uh, we made sure that we are not uh, reaching out to the people who are in a really vulnerable position. Uh, we also gave them the choice of where to conduct the interview, the interview, how to conduct the in interview, in which language to conduct the interview, because we had both Russian and Ukrainian speaking people in the team. And we too took care, which meant that we provided 
our interview partners with psychological support after the interview. We maintain the contact to make sure that these people are not experiencing any kind of difficulties after the interview. And I think that we uh, we wanted to make sure that we are responsible for these people and uh, also for the interviewers uh, in the team. Uh, and this is why we had the, the, the continual training and supervision in the team. And we are also responsible for the data, uh, which is the reason why uh, this collection is still not being an available publicly. It's not it's it's not online. Uh, it's not uh, used for for research yet. And now briefly about the collection. So in Poland, we've conducted uh, 2010 interviews uh, since June 2022. We only have 21 interviews with MACE, which is quite uh, understandable because uh, Ukrainian MACE are not leaving the country mostly, uh, legally at least. Uh, and those who are leaving it legally might not really be willing to speak to us because there's always this tricky issue of how much legal it was, uh, how much comfortable you feel with the fact that you left the country. So only 22 males. We had 73 interviews in Russian only uh, and 137 interviews in Ukrainian, which is quite surprising given the fact that uh, giving the geography of the project, because most of our um, interview partners came from came to Poland from southeast or east of Ukraine, which means that before the full scale invasion, they spoke Russian at home, and we only and we also realized during the interview or uh, during the informal conversation before or after the interview that they continue to use Russian at home here in Poland, but. Nevertheless, they consciously, consciously uh, chose Ukrainian as the official language of the interview. And, uh, and when we asked why, uh, they usually to told us that this is, I mean, that they are treating this inter interview as a testimony. This is a testimony, uh, an archival material that is going to be preserved for the future generations. So we don't want to use Russian in this interview. And this is the 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 the, the huge topic uh, for the future research, and they are mostly women with children, which also might define the the future uh, research uh, topics. Uh, and just few words about the state of the art. Uh, so um, the the phase of the documentation is is over. We had this more than two hundred interviews in Poland. We have one hundred and fifty interviews in Ukraine. Uh, about 100 interviews in Germany, uh, 50 interviews in Luxembourg, and 30 interviews in the UK. And we are now moving to the research, uh, because this is the moment when we uh, have the data and we can think about asking the, posing the real research questions. So we obtained the research funding for the Polish-Ukrainian-Luxembourgish cooperation, but the Germans will be stepping in. And what we are planning to do now is the second round of interviewing, which means that we are going to come back to our interviewees and, well, not to repeat our questions from the first interview, because that would be kind of cruel and not ethical at all, giving the fact what was inside the first interview usually. But we are going to do the follow-up interview, meaning we want to get to know what happened to these people, how they evaluated the first interview, whether it meant anything to them and how they want it to be preserved. So we are going to conduct a lot of content analysis and digital hermeneutic which, hermeneutic, which is not my field, but our Luxembourgish colleagues are very much in the field. And we also want to reach out a wider public with a graphic novel and animation movie. And what is most important for our Polish team is the archiving. We are going to uh, provide the digital access to the entire collection, which means the entire uh, material from the first round of interviews and then the second round of interviews, which will be up to 1,000, I guess, uh, in the local access points. And it will, it, which would mean that you are coming to the Warsaw Library, you are sitting on the computer and you might use the interviews. And this is the compromise between, well, making it all available online, which is not possible because this is really very sensitive data, and between closing it until the war is over. That was the idea at the beginning that we will make the collection open when the war is over, but 
at that point, nobody can predict when the war is over. And what it means is that the war is over. So we want to reach this kind of a compromise. Uh, and yeah, I think that this is pretty it. And uh, if you are interested in the interviews, I might talk more about them uh, during the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anna, for presenting your project. And I want to say that Anna supported us a lot with some insights uh, when we were preparing our project. Uh, and now, Kasia, I would like to ask you to present uh, on the Russian migrants and introduce to our project, if you could. I am happy to be the one to say a few words about the project that inspired uh, this conference. Um, I'm glad to speak about uh, about this uh, this project, about this uh, migration movement uh, in this particular discussion, which is about uh, the broad panorama of migration movements in, in and to Europe uh, and uh, of um, also about humanitarian crisis. The migration of Russians is part of this movement. Uh, it is uh, estimated that in uh, 2022, alone about 1 million people left uh, Russian Federation. And among there were uh, objectors, political refugees, uh, and uh, economic migrants as well. Um, our idea was to focus uh, not on the entire migration movement after the full-scale Russian invasion um, of Ukraine uh, began, but rather precisely on the migration related to so-called um, partial um, mobilization that took place in se September 2022. Uh, we had a feeling uh, that this migration movement would have a slightly different structure, let's say, uh, to the one in February, which was um, mainly an exodus of the liberal middle class uh, the upper class, uh, upper middle class, educated people with a strong anti-regime position, uh, politicized mainly, um, however, ethnic Russians, and mainly from the big cities, those who had the right capital, let's say, uh, whether social, cultural, or economic. These were the people who formed the core of the local uh, civil society, who often had the experience of participating in protest, activism, and so on, but also part of uh, the non-politicized middle class who were well off and uh, run businesses, uh, were kind of influencers, etc. Meanwhile, the, mig the migration movement after the announcement of uh, mobilization was more diverse in terms of class, ethnicity, and geographical location. Although um, initially by gender, it was mainly male uh, movement. It was also more sudden, uh, not prepared movement of, of, of migration. The first impulse to leave in this case was resistance to a policy that takes people to the front. People didn't want to take part in the war uh, for a number of very different reasons, which I will talk more about in a moment conducted a total of uh, 163 interviews in nine countries, uh, which is Finland, Estonia, Poland, Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and finally in Serbia. This is quite an impressive for me uh, result for a project called Intervention Project by our grant uh, provider, by NAVA. So we are proud of this number. Most of the researchers who conducted the uh, interviews were uh, are here with us today. So also, if there are questions about uh, specific contexts, uh, I think we, we can count on them. And tomorrow we'll have uh, another discussion uh, focused on particular countries yes, and context uh, in migration. To be honest, I'm still not ready to provide such an overall picture of the migration. We are in the process of transcribing and coding and analyzing the, all the data. Um, and it is worth saying that the story of migrants were, was uh, completely different depending on the region. 
So it was different uh, in the Caucasus, different in the countries of the European Union, and uh, still a uh, different case uh, of Mongolia, for example, uh, which uh, was reached mainly by uh, Buryats. Um, but I can talk about my research impressions from the field, our first uh, shared reflections, uh, trying to answer the main questions of our conference, was it indeed an invisible migration? Uh, was it indeed an anti-war migration? Uh, and finally, my first conclusions from a topic that uh, I was interested in, if I have uh, time, of course. So we started uh, the interviews approximately six months after the mobilization was announced. We finished approximately in September, a year later, um, we still can't say that the research is representative because it was qualitative uh, research. 70% of our respondents declared a higher education. As you can see, 25 of them are in this uh, cohort, age cohort 18, 25, 40, 26, uh, 30, and only eight above uh, 45. Most of them were of, uh, of, of, of conscript age, of course, yes, that was the main uh, aim. We were interested in the experience of mi migration, not in uh, political views, not in a biography uh, told uh, uh, from an anti-regime perspective, let's say. We wanted to hear about uh, why, how they made the decision, what the motivations were behind and uh, what the process of crossing the borders was like, what they took with them, how they organized themselves, how they arranged themselves on the spot, what their adaptation process was like, and, uh, and so on. Usually these were emotional stories um, about a, let's say, rash decision, one that would possibly decide life or death. They were also moments in which for a brief period people gained back their agency, their subjectivity, in which they had no intention of being army meat and experienced solidarity, something quite unusual for them in the Russian context, let's say. They helped each other, organized themselves into groups, have each, have each other, um, gave each other tickets for, for uh, definite flights, one of my respondents um, ended up in Yerevan in this way, when one of the random uh, uh, people gave him uh, his plane ticket because there were literary uh, none left to buy. Others picked themselves up uh, at the border where it was possible to cross it on foot or by car. Uh, they often felt unreal as if, if um, as in a surreal dream, let's say, surreal reality. Uh, one interviewee called it the feeling of being in the film when you are running away from something and at the back, everything is already on fire and there is no going back. Afterwards, they mostly experience a difficult time uh, with no prepared ground, no work, no connections, no idea of what was to come tomorrow. Uh, a gay couple told me that during the flight to Yerevan, they had all the time inside them that fear that that their plane uh, would be turned around or made to make an this emergency landing somewhere. Because after all, such a story happened in in Belarus. So so it was like they fear that something is going to happen during their flight. Once uh, they had passed all the border controls and were in a temporary shelter, they were sick for a week, they had a fever, and it was only after a week or two that they felt really safe and they realized that because of their sexual orientation, they had actually lived their, their whole life with a sense of fear of, of danger. It was repeated in many interviews that they were surprised that when they go out to the demonstration, to the political demonstrations, the police don't hurt them because they are not uh, because they are there to protect them, not to hurt them. 
And after leaving uh, the Russian Federation, our respondents generally uh, felt relief despite the unstable status, uh, legal status, uh, unstable uh, situation. And now this question, um, was it indeed an invisible migration? My first field trip to Armenia and shortly after that uh, to Georgia showed that not necessarily. In both cases, we cannot say that it was an invisible migration Rather the opposite, in Armenia, I saw mostly, uh, okay, thank you. I saw mostly Russian language posters in the city about events organized by the diaspora for the diaspora. Uh, the, these were um, concerts, meetings with writers, directors, um, and, and uh, it was uh, completely unproblematic uh, to reach uh, those places, this, this Russian, uh, map of uh, Yerevan. There was, for example, the Relocant pub, a pub of liberal, nostalgic, oppositional, opposition intelligent, intelligentsia, where the soundtrack uh, to the film Assa was uh, playing in the background, such as the hit song Piremien, for example. Uh, there was an activist meeting place like Humus Kimchi, where one where on the 1st of, of May you, you could uh, buy anti-war prints, anti-war posters, um, listen to many lectures such as on how to prevent uh, pre how to prevent ecological disaster, etc. Also, it was no uh, no problem to reach such places in Tbilisi, where uh, were already bookshops, restaurants, and clubs opened by Russians mainly for Russians. Uh, the difference here, however, was that space the walls shouted loudly that they dislike. Uh, of Russian and, and Georgians uh, refu um, refused to speak Russian at all. And some places didn't allow people with Russian passports to uh, to go in, yes? For example, some, some, some uh, fancy clubs. Uh, okay, so let me uh, just switch to, to this uh, second question uh, about uh, was it, is it this, mig this migration movement anti-war? I would say that yes. It is clearly anti-war, but anti-war attitude can be can have different uh, causes and can be defined in a different ways. All of our inter interviewees migrated, left Russia because of the war. Some because of their disagreement with the fact that their country, Russian Federation, is conducting a war in Ukraine, killing people every day, and therefore they are not able to stay within the borders of that country, pay taxes there, participate in this cultural and, and, and social life. Still, other people left because they didn't want to take part in this war. They didn't want to be called up to the army, to the front. And this doesn't clearly mean that those who didn't want to take part, uh, take, to be taken to the front, always disapprove uh, of this war, of this war in itself, in itself, for for the majority, uh, yes, it is like um, the same. But sometimes they were the very fact that Russia is uh, still conducting this war would not uh, have influenced their decision to leave, if it were not uh, for this direct threat of um, participation in the war. Especially interesting in this context are the statements of people who have served in the Russian army and uh, would, wouldn't want to, for anything, to experience war uh, in its ranks. And I have spoken to such respondents as well. And without doubt, there is a group of migrants for whom war, war simply disturb a comfortable, let's say, peaceful life. The country that is uh, at war is uh, in internal is is is, is in, in international isolation. So that, for example, gadgets such as electronic hoovers cannot be updated in Russia, and it was also a problem for my uh, interviewers. Although we can, of course, judge it ethically in a very different way. This is why we are here. Mm, what what I would like to say. Um, to close my 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 uh, short presentation of our project, this is why we are here, so that we can discuss some issues, share conclusions from different levels of observations, both macro level 
and uh, no less important individual experiences. Um, I am very curious about the voices from you. I still have many doubts in my mind, uh, also ethical about like thinking about this this, uh, this migration movement. So I am blessed that we are meeting here on call academic, let's say, grant to think together about how not to close borders and how not to build walls. Okay, so I will stop here. Thank you for your attention and um, yes, let's discuss. <laughs>